A warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 29th of November. Now I'm going to be looking at some UK data today and um, the amount of excess deaths in the UK is still about 7.5% but it is starting to trend downwards. It had been in the mid-teens of course for quite some time and to tell you the truth I didn't really relate this <laughs> that deeply on the video because I didn't want to be alarmist but when that excess death rate was continuing to increase week after week, it was really quite frightening. But I am really pleased to say now that it's starting to uh, come down. Uh, let's hope this trend uh, continues. We still don't have details on the cause of the excess deaths, but uh, the rate, at least in the UK, is starting to fall. And that is similar in Europe as well. It really was quite frightening when you see it going up and up and up and up. Um, anyway, as I say, some data from the UK today, and we'll be looking at obesity as a big risk factor for COVID as well. People with obesity have been more than twice as likely to die from COVID throughout the pandemic when adjusted for their age. But let's get straight on and look at some of the really interesting data that's around. Um, Zoe data, um, this is the Zoe uh, report that we uh, report on regularly. Uh, download it for yourself, completely transparent, uh, Zoe and King's College London. Now, um, this is always an interesting uh, slide here. Uh, this shows the people with uh, common colds and the people with COVID colds. And we see that common colds are now much more common than COVID <laughs> colds. Um, and in a sense, this is good because maybe 20, 30 percent of what we call common colds are actually caused by the four other types of endemic coronaviruses and we believe that they give us a level of cross immunity against SARS coronavirus 2. The majority are simple, simple rhinovirus infections which can make us feel pretty bad for a few days of course I'm not minimizing it um, but uh, that's the figures there so we see that the majority now are uh, COVID colds and not uh, the majority now are common colds here and uh, not COVID colds here. Now, uh, new cases in the UK for COVID, flattening off to going up slightly, I would say, on that data there. And when we look at the Office for National Statistics data, we find that that's basically, uh, basically an agreement there. So we do see that the rate is going down slightly, relatively low. And of course, the Office for National Statistics data is based on their surveys whereas the ZOE data is based on self-symptomatic reporting correlated with testing. So good news for England, Scotland much the same. The, the, the home countries are all fairly similar, decreasing rates of COVID. Now, given that we're going into winter, again, this is, this is quite a relief. Um, you know, what, what are we now? End of November, coming into December nearly. I was really quite worried um, that the cases would carry on increasing and the hospitals will be overwhelmed with COVID over winter. Now, the jury is still out on influenza. Uh, it's slightly above where we would like it to be for the time of year. Um, but as, car as far as COVID is concerned, it's, we're not seeing an explosion of COVID as the winter months start, which had been an anxiety. So um, two, two reasons for lower anxiety at the moment. The excess deaths are not continuing to rise. That's the one that really terrified me. And um, COVID cases are gradually going down, which is, um, of course, excellent news. Um, largely because more and more people are immune, of course. Uh, incidents across the age range. Um, what do we see here? Uh, the younger age group, yeah, they've had a bit of a spurt. But what's particularly useful here to notice, these here at the bottom are the older age groups. The 55 to 74 and the 75 plus, and they're going down. And of course, these are the groups that are at risk of hospitalization, most at risk of hospitalization. They're going down. So I think that's pretty good news for hospital co uh, for COVID hospitalizations over the next month or two, at least till the end of the year, I would hope. Now, um, you can't see the detail on this. It's, it's there if you want it. But the overall prevalence of COVID, according to the ZOE data, is one in 32 people. So it's still nearly a third uh, of people infected at any one, uh, any one week. The Office for National Statistics numbers are lower, um, one in 65 people. So what we can say is there's still an awful lot of endemic COVID around. And we expected this. We expected this. There's a lot of infections around. A lot of people having COVID infections all of the time. 
and reinfections. And of course, the Office for National Statistics data will be picking up asymptomatic infections as well. Um, now, that's the hospitalisation, which is good news. So it's going down. These are COVID hospitalisations in the UK. Intensive care admissions even lower. So, um, and based on the data that we've just looked at for the older age groups, I'm expecting that to continue at least into the new year. The hospitals are under tremendous pressure. At least COVID is going to be uh, a smaller part of that pressures, those pressures than we had feared. At least certainly I had feared. Um, less than four in 10 patients in, in hospital in England were, were there being treated primarily for COVID. So this is the people that are uh, hospitalised for COVID, uh, about what? Well, about 40%. These are the patients, these are the patients for COVID. These are the patients that are hospitalised with COVID. So we see that most patients at the moment who have COVID in hospital are not there for COVID. Most patients in hospital with COVID at the moment are there for other reasons. Again, encouraging as the general severity of the condition is becoming less really quite uh, encouraging considering we're in late November. Intensive care, it's an even smaller proportion. So these are the people in intensive care for COVID. These are the people in intensive care with COVID. And the vast majority of people in intensive care um, for COVID have significant, <coughs> excuse me, significant comorbidities. Uh, moving on, uh, excess, uh, de deaths and excess deaths. Now, this is the bit I've been... <laughs> really worried out. Now, I didn't show this on the videos, but as I've said before, when that trend was continuing, it really was quite alarming because I don't want to be alarmist on the videos, but it is quite a relief that the uh, excess deaths, although they're still there, they're not continuing to increase. Now, we need to analyse this. We need to know what this is all about. I'm not minimising it. Excess deaths are seven and a half percent greater than they should be for the time of year. It's a still a huge problem. If it had only ever been seven and a half percent, that would have been a massive problem. The fact that it had been up to about 16, 17 percent was an even bigger problem. We need to get to the bottom of this. Again, it's still not really being covered by mainstream media. What is going on in terms of excess deaths? We know some of the causes, um, but other causes are less clear. Uh, less amenable to public uh, discussion. But we, I, I'm not saying there's any particular cause that's, that's, uh, that's the main cause. There's a spectrum of causes, um, but we need to know what they all are. All the causes in this spectrum, we need to know what they all are. Uh, 417 deaths involving COVID in the UK. Okay, it's still significant, but that's involving COVID, of course. Many were with COVID, not from COVID. Uh, deaths involving COVID, 3.6 of all deaths in the UK, which is down from the week before. Can't read too much into that. There's always a bit of a fluctuation, of course. So a fall from 4.4. A total of 13,236 deaths were registered in the UK, 7.7% above the five-year average, so 941. So still 1,000 extra people died in the UK. This is not, I'm not minimising this. I'm just so relieved that the trend is not continuing upwards. Uh, it's still a big issue. Um, where this is going to go, of course, we simply don't know. But 941 excess deaths. Just imagine if there'd been a terrorist incident, 940 people were killed. It would be all over every media outlet you could possibly, you could possibly imagine. It would be, it would be mainstream news absolutely uh, everywhere. Um, but yet, yeah, 941 people extra have died. Okay. Seems to be the approach of a lot of mainstream media outlets. Really quite amusing uh, quite quite hard to explain really anyway that's the situation so it's down to 941 excess deaths still pretty um, well unacceptable without knowing the reasons uh, now these are the excess graphics here um, I know I know you can't see the detail here but the blue is COVID from the um, the blue is COVID from the uh, the waves some COVID deaths there. The black line is the, uh, is the average. But what I wanted to show really in detail here, uh, that um, the blue is the COVID deaths, the black is what we would expect. This green is all deaths, but the green above the black line is the excess deaths. And we can see that this is less than it was. Really hope this trend continues. You see, it's been high for so long. So many excess deaths for such a long period of time. And, and yet no one talking about it. It really was is still is an alarming situation because we don't know that this trend is going to continue yet we really hope 
that it is, but it's still high and it's still not being fully discussed. The reasons that are given are due to healthcare provision, um, but there's probably other reasons as well. And we really need a free, frank, open debate on this because there's a lot of people dying who shouldn't be. Some of whom, I know from the comments, are, are your relatives. Some of whom I know from the comments and emails are, are, your, are your children in some cases. When we look at this in terms of individual lives that, that uh, the emails and comments bring to light, it really is, well, it just makes it real, doesn't it? It just brings it to reality. Um, so that is still there, but less than it was. Uh, now, these are the uh, comorbidities in the deaths. I know you can't read this, but we'll just go through them quickly. Uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, yeah, you would expect that. Diseases of the urinary system, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, diabetes, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, hypertensive disease, cardiac arrhythmia, cerebrovascular diseases. And uh, people that died of COVID who were previously healthy, thankfully a uh, relatively small amount, but, uh, but still, still, still there. Mostly uh, the vast majority, of course, elderly who probably had, could, could have had, we don't know, but I mean... All older people have um, diseases, virtually all. Uh, you do get healthy 90-year-olds, but very often older people have comorbidities. Sometimes they are known about. Sometimes the comorbidities are um, unknown. So um, older people have a lot of undiagnosed uh, pathology. Most men in their 80s, for example, have prostate cancer, uh, whether they know about it or not. Usually they die of something else first. So they're the comorbidities in the COVID deaths. And particularly, just before we do the obesity, let's look at this one. These are people dying at home, at home or elsewhere. So more people are dying at home, more people are dying at other places than in hospital healthcare facilities. Now, in a sense, this is good because you want to die at home, not in some clinical hospital. Um, but in other ways, it's, it's a big change. And what I really want to know is how many of these deaths at home died suddenly. That's the data we're not given. How many had a protracted illness and died at home through a natural death process? How many, for want of a better term, without being too melodramatic, kind of dropped dead at home? Um, we need that statistic, Office for National Statistics, please. How many of these were chronic expected deaths? How many were more spontaneous, acute, unexpected deaths is the data that we really, really need, uh, but not provided at the moment. Uh, the death rate involving COVID-19 was high for those with obesity throughout the pandemic. And you can give figures on this. I mean, here, here's, here's a figure here from males. Uh, we see that people with um, obesity were more than twice as likely to die from COVID. Um, so... Yeah, more than twice as likely. It's always a good time to try and lose some weight. Eat a wide variety of plants, Tim Spector would advise. Uh, promote your microbiome. Avoid highly processed food. Exercise within your personalised uh, limits. Um, yeah, eat a wide variety of foods. We eat too many processed, the steaks are even worse. Sugars, we eat too many sugars, too many carbohydrates, too many processed fats. We need to sort of cook vegetables, get back to a more primordial uh, plant-based uh, diet. M meat's fine occasionally, of course, but um, um, that's the basic thing. We need to promote the microbiome, get some weight off and these other factors. Uh, those who reported symptoms with their first infections were less, in, uh, were less likely to be reinfected. So just a couple of other things from the Office of National Statistics. So people with symptomatic infections seem to develop more immune, immunity than people with asymptomatic infections, but the ONS doesn't give a figure for that. But it's good that the Office of National Statistics here is, is basically overtly no, not overtly, semi-covertly uh, admitting uh, that uh, natural immunity is a big factor. Thank goodness for that. Took a while. Uh, so there they are admitting that natural immunity is a factor, which is great to see. 
Uh, still a lot of people with long COVID, how that's going to pan out, we still don't know. A lot of those for over a year. That's all data from the Office of National Statistics. <laughs> now, what about COVID in the natural, in the sort of popular, um, this is what people think of a problem in the UK. So people are most worried about the cost of living, the NHS, the economy, change, climate change, housing, international conflict, crime, immigration, education, employment, EU exit, and then COVID-19. So um, I think rightly uh, the public are less worried about COVID than they were. And the more we are constantly living a normal life, the more we're going to be continuously re-exposed to all sorts of viruses and the more natural immunity we will develop. Delighted to see the Office of National Statistics are um, giving at least a, a nod to uh, natural acquired immunity through our wonderful human immune system. Quite enough data for one video. Thank you for watching.